All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I realize I'm I'm in the dark, but then so are lots of people in this country all the time. So this is not such an odd occurrence. What's happened is that despite my best efforts to circumvent the use of government, let's put it that way, I have um, gone off the grid. Uh, so what what happened was that um, there's a general power failure, mm. and because we don't have because we don't have a sun at night, it's a real. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's the real fuck up honestly I know, like, God, like god was the first government god messed up first. well no no he he is at least consistent at least he you know we, we know we know it gets dark you know his schedule, you know his schedule. Then gets, yeah then it gets light for a couple of hours and i don't know it'll be light just now i suppose so let's get cracking this monday morning we've got leanne we've got bakabantu we've got you and me we've got um beyond the scoreboard this morning so we'll be checking in on the sports results from the weekend, some very, very unhappy people when it comes to uh, Banyana, but some very happy people about South Africa playing rugby. And we'll get into all of that um, in just a short while. Also, we got Dr. Hanan on this morning. So if you're feeling a little fragile, he's the guy. He's the one. Hmm. He's who you can rely on to get you back on track. A little rough around the edges. Damn right. So what's happening? How was everybody's weekend? All good, all yeah. good. Um, I'm I'm crutch free. I'm driving. Oh, oh! Um, look at you. All, all two weeks before I was supposed to do those things, so I went for my my checkup um, this week and a, and a follow up X ray. What do they say? Walked into the doctor's rooms without my crutches, and the the receptionist looked at me strangely and she said, "You've had your, haven't you had your up?" So I said, yeah. She says, where, where are your crutches? I said, I'm so tired of them. I've just stopped. Well, everyone oh, wow. in the waiting room started clapping. <laughs> it, was, it was a really quite awkward but funny. Um, and, uh, yeah, I went into the doctor's rooms. He said, you've, you've done amazingly. You are clear to do anything you like. So, uh, wow. yeah. And then on top of that, because the, the one leg is so improved, I don't have to immediately do the other leg. We can wait a little bit, do some physio and see. So nice. I'm in great spirits. Very good I'm spirits. very, very happy. That's terrific. Well done. That's awesome so, news. Wait, it's a good way to start Monday. Because I think like in pictures, right? So I picture Leah just strutting in, walking into the doctor's office. Mm. Everyone like just cheers <laughs> and Mexican <laughs> waves. <laughs> Everyone Mexican <laughs> waves. <sighs> Leanne made it two weeks early. Record time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it happened. You know, I did forget how, how to start my car. Um, it's beep. <laughs> I started <laughs> it and then I started it again. You know that sound. Um, did someone have to? Did someone have to exercise your car for you while you were man down? Shame. Yes, my dad, who's in heart failure and had an operation himself. Oh my god! Wow, you. <sighs> You know, you got to find someone healthy to rely on. The end. <laughs> <laughs> We've got none left. None of us bred. That's the problem. <laughs> Only one so bread in the... Well, your parents did, and then you guys let down the clan, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, no, we, we totally did. And then and like... all, all, we've so many people have died. We've got more dead people than alive people in our family. Well, well you do well, have that's... that Australian contingent growing on there, so you guys should really focus on that side of the family. Clearly, they thrive. Bring them back, yeah. <laughs> we need them back here. So... Your your story is not that unusual. In fact, that is that is the story of Japan at the moment. They have more old people than young, and there's no replacement value. And they yeah. and you know they struggle to get people to even have sex in Japan. Um, yeah. They've got a big problem. Scandinavia. I mean, I think it's the Swedes or the Danish who are paying young couples yeah. their honeymoon. They're paying for their honeymoon, so they'll go off and breed because they realize like we we don't have enough kids. Um, it's happening in, in, I think, Canada's a problem there, too. Um, it's very, very odd, huh? Like, these are the places in the world that, that are run the best, and they, they just got these aging populations and no replacement. Yeah, I think that's what it's called, geriatric population. So this is where, like, if you remember COVID, this is where the spike hit in, in Italy because they had a geriatric population. Everyone right. was just old, and then the COVID just came and wiped them all off. But anyway, mm. like, uh, with Scandinavia, it's, it's not just the honeymoon, Gareth. It's everything. So if you decide to propose to your wife, 
you get three three years off, like what, like and then you guys wow. your honeymoon. You, your honeymoon is paid off. If you come back pregnant, you get maternity leave and paternity leave for three years, fully paid to raise your kid to make sure that this kid survives. So it's meanwhile, not just- meanwhile here in, in South Africa, you're like you've got you've got a granny who's like raising the whole ha- the whole family, and she gets she gets money from a little bit of the marojo that she sells on the side of the road. Yep. And she has to go and collect the firewood, collect the water and everything. Yep. And Not to like mention, 17 we're, kids we're, still de- no we're still dealing with um, a pandemic of AIDS orphans as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's like it's a completely alternate universe in Japan. It's fucking weird, huh? So listen to this. I mean, there's a Leanne who's listening to us. Um, she says, good morrow, dear friends. I cannot start cleaning my house until the show starts. The chats give me energy to get stuff done. Got my broom in hand and waiting. <laughs> this is at like three minutes to six this morning. Leanne, is, now that is a busy Jeez. woman. That is what a, a way to that start Monday. Efficient. But what Good an efficient you. human being. Isn't that amazing? Five minutes to six. She's like raring to go to clean the house. Love she's it. there with her broom. She's like just like b- oh, biting at it. the edge. Like, Ugh. But it's Absolutely. almost that for me, um, having ADHD, um, it's quite a big trait is not being able to do things unless you've got someone kind of bearing witness. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe maybe it's something like that for her. So Cunning that's Stunt cool. says, good morning from Mauritius for a few days. Oh, now that's nice. Cool. How, how nice is that? And then somebody else here in the, in the comments is in Portugal at the moment. So Very cool. Yeah, there's some people. Uh, our listeners are, are, here we go, morning from Portugal, flip-flop. So you know what? Uh, people are they're still living it up, getting out of the Joburg freezing cold for a little bit. But like, isn't Portugal and like that entire part of Europe burning? So I don't know. I don't know about Portugal. Yeah, it's a bit hot, eh? Hey. Hey. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit warm, but I I'd rather have that right now. I mean, I'm just over. I'm so over winter. I, I was over winter in June, frankly. It's yeah. enough. Over, you're over winter before it started. <laughs> all right leanne you missed a great show on friday we were discussing bras and breast sizes with simpiwe and it got quite fascinating for the men says rebellious ruth who's of course the chairperson of the comment section and she's right people were fascinated i actually got uh an email or two from some people who were very very interested in all of that and wanted to know more and i said look i'm not the fountain of knowledge here actually <laughs> leanne, she's she she and simpiwe seem to be like really clued in i mean simpiwe suddenly held forth with like a whole lot of info that we didn't know before. So she was very helpful on Friday. Oh, sorry. I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you missed, you missed a good one. And uh, what else? There was, uh, there was other stuff this weekend that happened besides sports. I'm trying to think what it was. Uh, George um, B was so fascinated about the brass thing. He was blown away. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. He was blown <laughs> away. <laughs> Had conversation. Get one, like, get one people like, can we please move on from the bras? This is getting tiring. So I think <laughs> maybe it wasn't everybody's thing, right? So. All right. Uh, well, it is a brand new week. We're already at the 7th of August, and we've got lots to talk about this morning. Um, with Dr. Hanan, we'll be doing an open Q&A session. So get your relationship questions ready and you can bring those to Dr. Hanan. He's always willing to hear from you and help you solve some of the problems. We can't solve all of them, but we can get damn near close, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Just to clear up, um, Leanne says, no, no, guys, I'm in Perth and it's midday. <laughs> I'm lazy. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> So just to check, that's the Leanne who's cleaning her house. All right. Makes, Very good. Makes us all feel much better. Thank you. Yes. Well, I thought Perth was like the capital of racism or something like that. <laughs> that's where all the Afrikaners went. It's amazing how that becomes like the thing. It's it's actually like uh, it was born a mining town because Western Australia is mostly mining. Um, but it's, there are a lot of South Africans there. And I think the reason is because it's similar climate wise. Yeah, it just looks here. like South Africa. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's why a lot of people moved there. And frankly, can you really fault them considering how this place is being run at the moment? Do you think we're the idiots or they're the idiots? And be honest here. Like, I'm the one sitting in the dark, right? No, 100%. I mean, you you, you guys know that my family um, went to Australia many decades ago. 
two decades ago, yeah. two decades ago. And uh, we were supposed to go with them, but decided not to. And uh, just the other day, my brother and I were reversing out of the driveway and there were these two suspicious guys behind the car. It was nighttime. Yeah. Um, and they, they actually stopped and we thought, okay, right. this is happening. You know that feeling? It's like, yeah. okay, yeah. we're ready. Um, and uh, it turned out that wasn't the case or they changed their mind. And as we drove off, um, Mark, <laughs> Mark, who's very anti-Australia, said, fuck, we should have moved to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the last to admit it. My dad always mm -hmm. rips him off saying that one day he's going to find a nice Australian partner. And um, we, we, he's, he's always been anti. So it was like a big step for him to say that. Congo Chris reckons I've never looked more like a vampire than I do in the dark this morning. <laughs> North for right. Yeah, it does look like you're concocting something. Uh, for me, I thought he joined. Though. If I, he finally admitted that he was a Sith Lord. <laughs> yeah, Gareth, you that's where like I went. Yeah, how's this? Gareth, you look like a glow stick, says uh, Sanella, sticking out <laughs> of a concert crowd, sitting in that ass cunt dark. Yeah, well, <laughs> listen, it's not just. It's not just dark, it's cold as well. So that makes it even better. I'm sitting here freezing my bollocks off at the same time. This, this house of mine is not warm. It faces west um, because mm. there's a river. It. So it faces that way. So I get lovely afternoon sun in the winter, um, which is kind, kind of annoying in summer because it's so bright. But in the, you know, most houses in South Africa, you face north. So you get the maximum mm. amount of sunlight. Not this one. So it gets pretty chilly. It's not a warm house. Oh, oh, such tough problems, Gareth. I know <laughs> such, tough, such tough you, problems. Your face, you know your house, is, your mansion is facing uh, west. Uh, <laughs> so I watched the show last night. I've never seen this before. It's on one of those property channels that nobody watches. Um, it's called Listing Josie or something. And there were houses going for 40, 50 million rand in Johannesburg. Dude. 40 or 50 million rand in Joburg. And guess what? Blew up. guess what? All of them faced north. So don't <laughs> throw at me like I'm talking a lot of shit here or this is some kind of, uh, you know, only people who have, I don't know, more than 500 rand to rub together can talk about these things. This is stuff people need to think about. I stumbled, like speaking about places, I stumbled on a list on the most undesirable provinces in South Africa. So there's only <laughs> nine. There's only, like, I, there's, only, there's only nine provinces, right? So which do you think is the most desirable province, Leanne? Mm, uh, West probably Cape. Gauteng or Western no, Cape. Western yeah, Cape. yeah it's, it's Western Cape, right? But like Gauteng, uh, like they do like define it, like they say Gauteng for the jobs, Western Cape for everything yeah. else. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And then the yes, least... Some, something's going beep. I think we're about to lose power. Hang on. Oh, dear. You can carry on telling me. <laughs> so anyway so now the number one right so here i am thinking ah of course it's probably like northern cape or, because no one stays in the northern cape ah, yeah eastern cape represents i'm uh, like hey. and then they proceed so and then the article just changes into this indictment of the eastern like, cape there's like they it's jobless it's warning me it's warning me i've got like i don't know a couple of minutes left so god knows what's going to happen here oh goodness me we're losing you <sighs> well, Gareth, uh, it, it's was, been, it was nice knowing it's been you. Fun. Nice knowing so you. What, yeah. was, what was the most undesirable province? I missed that. E Eastern Cape. And the oh, article yeah. went from being positive yeah. about like how South Africa is such a beacon of hope to how the Eastern Cape like has all this potential, but just squandered it. People are mm -hmm. moving out because there's no jobs, there's no roads, and I'm like, yo, this article started out so well because we we're talking about like South Africa, like. Yeah, and it just turns so badly when you got to the Eastern Cape. Yeah, so the least undesirable province is the Eastern Cape. And they, they sure. opened it up by saying they have the largest coastline. It's the second largest province. The people are nice. Speaking about PE people. Yeah, and then like, no. But anyway, no one wants to be there. I'm like, yeah. That place really is a toilet. And it's been run into the ground by the government. That's the, mm -hmm. it's not natural. It's not the people of the province or nature or you know a really terrible climate or any of that stuff in fact all of that is a, pu a plus it's yeah. because it's been run like a spaza shop but a bad spaza shop uh jp russell has some macgyver advice for you here gareth go 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 yeah. he says go to your ups and like <laughs> put in an echo flow 
Go to my UP. What? Get in. No, but I can't saying... do that. JP, I can't do that now. It is what it is. <laughs> I flip and hate that UPS's beep. Get an echo float. Spends a bit worth it. Well, I can't do anything about it now. <laughs> I, I just quickly run to the, to the store, like the corner, Gareth. <laughs> Get in it. Don't leave it beeping. It screws the battery up. <laughs> oh, my God. Now what am I going to do? Panic stations. Should I switch it off? Okay, you, you talk amongst yourself. Let me switch it off and see what happens. All right? All Hold right. on. Have you got enough power here to make it through? Like, uh, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Give me a sec. This is like that... Um... What was that vessel that went down to the Titanic? The Titan. Yeah. It's like that feeling like of running out of, when we first thought they were running out of oxygen. It's that type of panic right now. <sighs> At least it's not, it's not a bad beeping noise. At least we know he's not going to blow up or anything. But don't touch it, Gareth, in case it does blow up. <laughs> Just my advice. Jeez. Leanne, <laughs> so you had an encounter with Chat GPT. Tell us about that. Yes. So... I actually saw this in some f fictional series that I watch. Um, it was like some sci-fi series where they made up that you could kind of talk to the dead. So there was a yeah. company that followed the history of everything that the, the, the dead person had done, their tone of voice, the way they spoke, and they kind of used AI to bring back this person so that as a grieving person, you could speak to your, your lost loved one um for a few hours a day or whatever and that's coming to life now i mean it's flipping crazy so with thanabots chat gpt is making it possible to in inverted commas talk to the dead um so these these chatbots are trained on data of the deceased yeah. um and it's a project called project december a program rather called project december and what you can do is okay so so they're not just taking the information willy-nilly from out of nowhere, you are allowed to input inf information yeah. about this person. So you can send um, all of your communication from WhatsApp, your emails, um, voice notes, things like that. And I, leave you alone. I leave you alone for two minutes and you start <laughs> talking about death. <laughs> well, we thought you were gone. No. So we you started talking about death. Yeah. Oh, we, we thought, thought this is optimistic. Safe. We're talking about technology and yeah, how so technology now, is allowing us to speak to the dead. So now I'm sitting in what? complete darkness. I can't, I can't operate the desk or anything. So I'm on using my phone as a hotspot. Luckily, I got oh, battery boy. on my phone still. And the only light you're seeing is the light from the screen. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, you could be anywhere. You could be in a tent, in the garden, anything. Oh, well, at least you're here. Kind of. Yeah. Well, I'm here. I'm here. I'm partaking in the show. This is a, you know what it is? This is experiential. This is how uh, people in South Africa have to deal with things on a daily basis. It's so great. Uh, wait, everyone in Portugal, everyone in wet Vienna, this is how we live. <laughs> we may <Yeah>. do. <laughs> so, uh, and, and those of our listeners who are on holiday in like Mauritius and Turkey and all over the rest of the places where, you know, where they've got electricity, exactly. but they've also got really nice weather at the moment. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we found out the shittiest province. What well, the best one was the Western Cape, right? Yeah, it was the Western Cape. I thought Free State would make it through. I thought Limpopo. I thought Northern Cape at least. The Northern Free Cape. State. The, the Free State is shitty as hell. But like Eastern Cape runs through. And it's all about yeah. this whole potential thing. This thing you were talking about, about how it's not the people, it's literally yeah. it's the government that did it. Yeah. But we're talking like we, what you miss, Gareth. <clears throat> Leanne was telling us talking about talking to the dead through robots. And the, the, the episode you were talking about, Leanne, is I think a Black Mirror episode where you, you just upload this That's guy's. It. Yeah, you upload your entire history from your phone, WhatsApp, Twitter, and whatnot. And then the, yes. the bot kind of mimics the personality. That was oh, it. So it well feels done. like Thank the person's you. still alive. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, so you're in still this alive. case, hey. there, so you can actually do that now with this um, project called Project December. Um, and it's related to chat GPT. Um, and they started with a, like a sample, an example called Thanabot Spock. Um, oh, yeah. That's when the, the programmer, his name's Jason Rohrer, he realized that he can create chatbots that emulate specific people by feeding all of these examples about how they communicate. So he started yeah. off with Star Trek's Mr. Sp or Dr. Spock, Mr. Spock. 
as any yeah. good nerd would. And he launched Project December. And uh, now anybody who's paying can input all sorts of data and information and make their personalized chatbots. You can do it, you know, based on someone who's alive, but the idea was so that you could kind of revive people from the dead and uh, yeah. help that, let that help you through your mourning process. Well, I, I mean, don't know if I'd want to. So Thana, Thana comes from, um, from death in, in Greek mm -hmm. and Thanatos would be Thanatos, the, the god of the dead. And then therefore Thanabots would be bots of the dead. So that's very clever. And you know what? Yeah, you know what a, resurrection. Do you know what North Korea is? What? It's a called country? a than thanatocracy because technically, <laughs> uh, because technically North Korea is run by a dead person, Kim Il Sung. Oh he's yeah, still the, they, he's still the head of state. Yeah. Despite so is, is the that when he's we, been dead. Is that since when we the stopped 70s. recognizing them, or why? Uh, is no, that? no, no. So you know, like for example, America <laughs> claims to be a democracy. Um, a country like uh, Syria is an autocracy. Um, a country like South Africa is a kleptocracy. And a country like <laughs> North Korea is a thanatocracy. So now you know. There, you've learned some useful words for this morning. Uh, well, well, didn't Thanatos, like, like didn't he uh, carry the dead, like, on the river sticks to Correct. hell? Yeah, to Hades, Correct. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the underworld, yeah. You had cool, to so pay him. You had to pay him coins. That's why they put the coins on yeah, the dead people's eyes. People's eyes. Yeah, you had to pay him. Your, your, otherwise, he wouldn't carry you through the river sticks and you'd be lost Correct. forever. And and you know what, Congo? Chris is quite right. He says America is a plutocracy, which it is, because it's being run by an elite of people <laughs> whose families have been running the place for the last sort of 50 to 100 years. And that's why you've got people like Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden and those kind of people there. Mm. You know? Same, same. Uh, uh, I remember when the world blew up because Nancy Pelosi went to get a haircut after telling people to stay in their homes. And not... Right. <laughs> right. She really needed that haircut when, when people needed to run jobs. But, uh, Correct. Anyway. But my, my run in Iliad with AI was, was pretty cool. Like, I, I, I yeah. literally fed this bot. Like, it was a sentence. Makabantu as James Bond. And it gave me back <laughs> an image. Like, that's all I fed it. I didn't, that sentence. So what did it come okay. as James Bond? I think Ryan loaded up a picture. It had Let's like see. the coolest picture. Like, oh, maybe I could just show it. Here we go. Screen. We got here. We got comic characters here. Oh wow! I'm like, how do you know my haircut? <laughs> how did it know <laughs> like your skin color? <laughs> yeah, wow! Because my, because my name has like Arabic feel. So I'm like, what the hell? And wait, oh. his, you as Batman and then, or yeah, Superman and, or something? Exactly. Then this is Bakabantu as a superhero that's all i gave oh, it wow, wow. that's Pretty all cool. i gave it i gave it those two sentences and then this is what came back i'm and like i didn't know my like, they're not even like those some of those shitty ai results that we get where it's blurred or the mouth's like no, that's pretty good yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty damn good on. i like that dude especially the superhero uh, one they even got the physique like, and I, don't know how they did that. <laughs> I got i got ba bakabantu as a politician <laughs> Cyril, that's what it came up with. Oh my god! Oh, that's Listen, amazing. I have to. If 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 I get into those AI um, illustration generators, I'll be busy for years. I Oof. that stuff will keep me. So, what did you use? Which one did you use? Uh, it was one like just just an app I downloaded called Image, and then you can even choose an art style right. because I have like a bunch of Van Goghs where like yeah. you know like the Van Gogh image where he cut his ear, I have like that yeah. and a Starry Night. I'm like, oh. Dude, it's 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 really that's you can choose pretty, the art style. Right. That's awesome hmm. though. Can you imagine how many people who are vain are going to get like pictures of themselves done like that? Right? And, and like if you go like if you go like premium, you can even upload pictures so it can even model hmm. your face and whatnot. So I just yeah. went with like just the typing by Kabantu as a superhero and then like bah. I love oh, that. Because you, then you, you can have like the most beautiful, like detailed pictures painted. Or rather, drawn by the by this thing, and then and then printed, and you can have an artist then go and like. Uh, re in fact, I suppose there's probably a program that will make it look like it's an oil painting, yeah. you know, three D printed as as a kind of an oil painting or something. I, I just think that's absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> oh, in the so style of in the style of Van Gogh, I mean, how cool is that, dude? Uh, so like, this is Bakavantu as a villain, 
kind of similar, but like I look more. Yeah, sinister. it's exactly the same. Yeah. In fact, in fact, you don't have. They've taken the horns away. Now you would think the <laughs> horns would be for a villain. No, 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 no. I think that's like they were going for a Batman feel. <laughs> yeah, well, it looks like that one looks like horns, if you ask me. <laughs> and horns usually I associate with the devil. So, no, but like the, <laughs> they had me at the James Bond one because it was the first experience. I literally just typed in. Bah, 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 right. I it. And then it's like, suit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, try like Leanne is a cat lady, but no, then it's <laughs> and, and then it just gives you a self portrait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is going to be a fun game to play. I think everybody's going to get onto uh, AI, and eventually, you know, we'll all have versions of ourselves in our our profile pictures, uh, as 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 if it was painted by Da Vinci or Michelangelo or Van Gogh. But like, but this is what the artists are complaining about. So, so mm. should 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 Da Vinci or Van Gogh, if they still are with this, still alive, or like modern day artists, if I steal sure. your artwork, right? Like, if I take mm -hmm. Gareth's voice, because these things can even voice emulate. If yeah, I were sure. to like go on Thanabots and load up your Twitter timeline, and then mm -hmm. basically I have, tw I'm just typing and talking to Gareth there, and it just generates your voice. Is that fair? Well, how sad for Gareth. you, first of all. How pathetic <laughs> for you that you're going to go and create a bot to talk to you to pretend it's me, and that's going to make <laughs> you feel good about yourself. I mean, what a sad sack of shit you are if that's what you're looking for in but, the world. But now you see, if I fed the robot that, then it would tell me, it would tell me that I'm a sad piece of shit, like delete yeah, the exactly. Like... It would and, start and you know by what? going, hello, you sad sack of shit. <laughs> so joking atheist immediately points out, if porn is exploitative of women, is AI porn still bad? But you know what's going to happen, right? And it's already happening, is AI porn is going to be a thing. So mm. you're going to have people talking to chatbots as if they're real, you know, these sad, pathetic loser men who in the dark. are looking for companionship. Freezing You're sitting in the also. dark, freezing, <laughs> talking to, you know, AI. Unfortunately, and dumb it, that it has already started in, I know. in the child yeah. porn industry. Well, not, let's yeah. not call it an industry, yeah, well, but it course. has already started. All, all the sickos are going to find this and they're going to exploit it for their own purposes. That's what happens. And you know what happens is that usually on the internet, the first two things that people start doing once they have any kind of uh, computing power, networking, AI, whatever other tools they can plug into it, is they start gambling and they start porn. That's, yeah. Those are the two areas that people always go to first. Can't help it. There's nothing we can do. It's very, very weird. I actually have a segue to that. There's something called Rule 42. I'm not sure if it's Rule 42 or something. But like, yeah. there's something called Rule 42 where, okay, it's, okay, and it's not Rule 42, but on the internet, there's this rule that if you've thought of it, it probably is on the internet as a porn picture. So if you've sure. thought of Leanne as a cat lady or a cat being sexy, there's probably an, an image of a cat being naked sure. or something like that. If you've sure. thought of a car, like, oh, well, how would cars be having sex? There's probably an image. Someone has thought about it and uploaded Definitely. it on the internet. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, the, it's, it's going to be some. It's so true. It's like that with inventions, and I rem I remember when um, you know everything became digital and it was all fantastic in the beginning. But then you realised that the joke that you'd made up as a creative was already out there. Someone else had thought about it. Especially when Twitter came about, you realised that thoughts that you thought only you had were already <laughs> out there. Other people were thinking yeah. them. Yeah, there's no such thing as uh, you know true creativity anymore yeah. originality because someone somewhere has already thought of it which is just unbelievable i mean it's kind of depressing i, I always is. cite the example <laughs> always cite the example of my friend who's a, a musician and he can play the guitar like no one else and he said to me once you know there are only eight chords or there are only eight uh, keys on this on on, on any in musical instrument you know mm. and that once once all the combinations have been exhausted and now thanks to AI, we can figure out just how many combinations there are. And once all those combinations have been exploited to the nth degree and rearranged, and you know, they've changed the tempo on certain songs and introduced new instrumentation or whatever else it is, eventually there's not going to be any more music left, which I found very depressing. Other yeah. people who are musicians tell me it's not true, that there will always be infinite combinations available. There will be ways of, of, of arranging songs that have never been thought of before. And maybe that's true too. 
I'd prefer for, it to be the latter, frankly. Yeah, you'd prefer the latter. Everyone would prefer the latter. But yeah. like, yeah, the rule, as Congo Chris points out, it's rule 34. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so but it, but like with this with this eight chords thing, I think Beethoven and Mozart did end music at some point. That that's when well, we went into the, 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 the 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 depression, or even 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 you, like Leonardo, and like and Raphael, can, and all of them just broke art. All of the Ninja while. Turtles, <laughs> all yeah. the Ninja Turtles you just broke happened. art for a while. That's when we got these monoliths of just stone buildings and gray, because these people just went full on art and no, they no, art no. for everyone. Nonsense. There's still some good stuff from from the 1500s until very recently. But I'll, I'll agree that like architecture has gone to absolute shit. I put this picture up the other day of, you know, a building that was built, let's say at the turn of the last century. So around 1900, and you see this just beautiful stone work and, and everything is, is proportioned beautifully. And people have taken trouble to like do the detail. And you can see someone's thought about how they want this building to look from a distance, from close up, Every little bit of architectural detail is, is, is accounted for. And then you look at modern buildings. It's like glass and chrome and concrete. And it's just, it's like so shit. And the same goes for, you know, you could argue that music reached its apogee in, you know, in the classical era, that that was the most complex that music has ever been. And I don't think any music since then has been as complex. I don't think anyone will argue that, right? Um, no, no. And when you listen to like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and you compare that to pretty much anything, and I love, listen, I love music, hey? I could listen to music till the cars come home. And I'm a big fan of, you know, modern music. By modern music, I mean anything from the last sort of 20 to 30 years. Yeah. But I'm afraid when you do, when you line up something like, you know, Rachmaninoff on the piano and some pop song by... Yeah. Taylor Swift. You're like, come on. It's not even a contest, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's not even a cut, And it's just instrumentation because I remember like the first time. So it was, it was, I was watching a wrestling show, uh, WWE. And then this theme song plays. And I, I downloaded the theme song and I found out it was like Flight of the Valkyries. And then this was written mm -hmm. like a long time ago. I'm like, whoa, such a jam. <laughs> Wagner, the Ride yeah. of the Valkyries. Yeah, right um, of the Valkyries. Bum, ba, ba, bum, 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 ba, ba, bum, 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 Yeah. I'm like, no, no, okay. no, no, Cardi listen, B, you can, you can keep your up. <laughs> listen, we've got to get into some sport because Ryan is furious. He, um, he lost a ton of, ca of cash over the weekend. Great, he had man. high, high hopes. Yeah, he had such high hopes after Banyana's victory last Wednesday. And uh, now it's time to check in on some sports. So let's go beyond the scoreboard with super bets and uh, Bakabanti's got some results for us. Go on, tell us. So women's FIFA World Cup, heart's broken. Ryan's angry. He's a very angry man. I, walk, uh, I walked into studio. Ryan is always a jolly. He's always jolly. He's always happy. I walk in, I'm like, what happened? He's like, I was going to make 250 grand and I didn't. So what oh. happened is in the women's FIFA World Cup, Banyana Banyana lost to Netherlands 2-0. And then if yes. South Africa lost to Uganda to finish the six over but to fix, finish sixth. Is Ryan there? Yeah, Ryan's there. Ryan is. Yeah, there he is. Ryan. Oh, he's... Morning. Let me tell, yeah, let me tell you something. Uh, you heard Ben <laughs> on Friday. You should have listened to Ben. He said the Netherlands are rated here. South Africa is rated there. A little bit of mathematics could have helped you out there, dude. You got carried away. You you bet. You did what Hanan always tells us not to do, and you used emotion <laughs> rather than your brains. But right. to, to be fair, Ryan, you've made more money than Ben, right? <laughs> I've made more money than Ben. Uh, but Gareth, this was the perfect weekend because the thing is, right, the odds were in the Banyana's favor, but like majorly. So it was like 13 times the amount of money that yeah. you put mm. down. So I, I put down like... 200 bucks and i was gonna make like two and a half thousand rand if they came through it is so it's like you just have to find the the the, the perfect kind of match where the odds are no, in I your favor you. and I, there's I, just I mean, the that would, chance that would have been amazing right i mean like you put down so your risk is low i mean you're not going to go and uh you're not going to go hungry for the rest of this week because you bet on banana right no risk is low reward was high yeah That's... but listen <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. All I can say is I'm really sorry. Like you were so amped up. I, I actually. Oh, I was so hyped. I got the most brilliant thing. Uh, someone sent me a screenshot of yours on on Twitter, 
I think it was on Twitter. Oh yeah. Where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Ryan was so excited, right? Oh yeah. He's well, so excited that I just and can't hide, hide it. it. <laughs> I was, I was, I was gonna wake up to some good money because there was also there was also so, a fight with uh, with Diaz and and Jake Paul. Yeah, Diaz. right. You went Diaz. Yeah. Everyone went Diaz. Ryan's Jake like one. <laughs> I knew, dude, I knew Jake was going to win. Like, I was telling people I this put from some, the beginning. He goes, I put some big bets on Banyana Banyana for tomorrow morning. <laughs> All of us in <laughs> Central are behind you alongside Super Bets. We can't wait for you to kick ass. <sighs> FIFA World Women's World Cup. And uh, yeah, just uh, it didn't go that way. So what else happened over the weekend? Well, the Rugby Internationals. So we had our rematch with the Pumas and we beat them. Uh, the B and squad. That was, like our, that was our B team. And they were wearing like listerine colored uniforms dude. right oh. dude, yeah it was what it was so bad who but decided like, what idiot decided that was a good color for the yeah i was gonna say that's not it well that's not well, it well if if the, the safa president can claim but banyana banyana's victories so i guess we can blame the rugby guy <laughs> we can, we can seriously like them. Who I, you know, a lot of people in marketing and in branding get to make some terrible decisions and they never held responsible for them. I want to know who made that decision. I think that person should be fired. What a but shit like, remember, color. Also, remember, let me when tell you, I was, went pink. I was on the edge of my seat for that one because yeah. the first half, they were down like 13-3. Yeah. And they like came back miraculously second half. It was insane. Dude, and there I had go. money. I had money on the Pumas because I'm like, ah. You had money on the Pumas? <laughs> no, the B team. Uh. Come on. Okay. No, like no, like I don't, I don't do patriotism, guys. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Okay. So, yes. so we we would have won if we'd put money on South Africa against Argentina, yeah. which was a good yeah. one. Now Ben did say we should do that. What else happened? No, that was basically it. Besides the boxing, it was well. Nate the, Diaz, Jake Paul. Yeah. Besides, yeah, that was the boxing. Nate Diaz versus Jake Paul. This is an exhibition fight. It's all for yeah. money. Mm-hmm. They made billions, and and Jake Paul always wins these things, and it's, we all think it's corrupt because he runs. No, the well, promotion. Jake Paul's a boxer. You know, Nate Diaz is a street street fighter. He's an MMA he's a, fighter. Yeah, yeah, he's a he fighter. had no chance. Yeah, he had no chance, but he won if by. You're trying to be a boxer with an with a you know, being lost, an MMA fighter. Yeah, at least he lasted all the rounds, and then they went. No, to he so lasted Ryan, ten rounds. Uh, Ryan, do yeah. you have any money left? Are you going to be able to bet anything this week? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you, Gareth. From from the other banana game, I still have money left over. Don't worry. <laughs> But okay, it's, all yeah, good. All right. it's all it's all, all part right. of the game. You charge it to the game. This is this is how it is. You win some, you lose some. And... But we're looking to the World Cup in terms of rugby. So we'll see a Khaleesi be in the squad. Oof, that's the real question. But the thing is with this whole thing, guys, it's like I only I only put money in the game if I've got extra money to play. I don't I don't like put my last money on it. You know what I mean? Oh, very when is no when to no stop. To stop. <laughs> That's right. And you can always call the South African Responsible Gambling Foundation toll-free hotline 0800-006-008, Ryan, if you get too deep in it. Super I don't need to call them Responsible yet. Gambling. Strictly no under 18s. Winners know? When to stop. When to stop. Great. Thank you. God, you, you guys took so long on that. I thought I was on my own. All right. So there we are. Super bets. Go along and find out more on cliffcentral.com and you can start placing bets too. Hopefully you have better luck than Ryan did this week. But I mean, yeah. he has had luck before. So we'll see. Maybe he'll have it's another lucky. lucky week this this uh, coming weekend. All right. Nice yeah. stuff, Ryan. Thank you. Cool. There's, uh, there's our own producer, Ryan. Okay. So um, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk also. I see about Dr. Hanan, who'll be joining us in just a moment. And um, I saw this. Didn't we play that clip? So Courtney says, from a color psychology perspective, it was supposed to symbolize revitalization and transformation. Well, Courtney, I hate to tell you, but we did a, we played a clip of that psychologist. Remember, Leanne, that very grumpy uh, English guy. Oh, yes. Said, yeah, the very grumpy no, is like, no. Nonsense. Color doesn't nonsense, matter. All of this. Mm. Yeah, that it's all just absolute bullshit. And maybe... Courtney needs to see that guy's clips and, and go and follow him on, on social media. It might be a good idea. I think it looked stupid. <laughs> no, I mean, come on. When you're in your head, if you think green and gold, you think spring box. Spring box, what, yeah. And I, know, I, I want to I know see the could, colors. So what am I searching for? Search for South, South Africa uniform versus Argentina. It should come up. It's like but we, Listerine, sort of green, like uh, like cream soda almost. Uh, only 
like sort of even worse because it was so it was just so insipid. Um, and and I can just imagine a whole team of creatives sitting around a table, but, like with a whole like... bunch of color swatches, going, guys, I think we should go for this one because it symbolizes revitalization. Yeah. And like they thought yeah. they cracked the code. This is what it looks like. Yeah. No, Isn't that horrible? Exactly, exactly what they're Horrible. Doing. And MTN's logo is now black and white and boring as can be. It's like it's from the 60s. So that also looks horrible. So I don't know what they're thinking. I really don't. So at least very, it wasn't the boring. worst color. The, the, the color that's rated the most horrible in the world. Is and what? that's this like, it's like a poo green. I don't know the Pantone. <laughs> but it's like a, a mustard poo color. Hang on, and I'm going to see if I can find the worst color in the world. <laughs> okay. And um, that's in Australia. They All the cigarette boxes. <laughs> of course, it's Australia. <laughs> have, to, have to have that color on it. <laughs> it's Pantone 448C. It is a color in the Pantone color system descri described as a drab, dark brown and informally dubbed the ugliest color in the world. You are so smart, Leanne. You know all this really interesting stuff. Um, so it was selected all the cigarette in 2012. Boxes have got those, yeah, and then they there's, there's... Um, they have photographs of like rotting teeth and bleeding <laughs> lungs, and it, like you can't even recognize a packet of Marlboro or versus here's the anything color. else. So here's the color, it's sort of poo green. There it is. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> That's the color. I'm changing all of our um, <laughs> background <expansion>. logos. <laughs> <laughs> to like a poo green. I love that. All right, let's get to Dr. Hanan. He hasn't got time to waste. We might have, but he doesn't. Hey, Doc, how are you? Hey, guys, I'm well. How are you? Good. Sitting in the dark, but you know what? Other people have it worse, so I'm not going to complain. It reminds me of, uh, you know, have you ever seen the Queen Bohemian Rhapsody uh, video? Yes, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm doing that. Uh, I very good. Uh, all right. What do you think of that color, Doc? Is that the worst color in the world? I mean, like, color what does that color make you feel? What do you oh, think? How does that, that make, make you feel, oh, Doc? I can't even look at it. I'm looking away. I, I don't mind it at all. I would still smoke those cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, well, you would smoke the cigarettes regardless. Okay, so listen, it's an open uh, conversation this morning with Dr. Hanan. If you've got a question for him, get in there ASAP. First of all, Doc, is color psychology nonsense? No, it's not nonsense. You walk okay. into a red room or you walk into a white room, it brings up different uh, physiological sensations. So not at right. all. Okay. So, I mean, some people uh, respond to colors in a very emotional way, or is it more of a... Uh, a, a, a subconscious uh, kind of association. It, it is subconscious. Uh, psychologically, what we do a lot is we allow people, we manipulate people's feelings through the use of five or their five senses. So touch, smell, taste, sound, sight. So mm -hmm. if I make you smell something really beautiful, it will change how you feel. If I make you smell something really yes. horrific, it will change the way that you feel. If I make you hear something beautiful, it will change the way you feel. If I make you hear something horrific, same thing. And the same thing with sight. Sight is no different. It just taps into a very primitive part of your brain that changes your emotional state immediately, immediately. Right. So we manipulate yeah. a lot of, or we use that to manipulate people's feelings. So we use a lot of color. We use sights. We use sounds. We use taste. If I give you a teaspoon of salt, your, your emotions are going to change immediately. Um, so we use a lot of that to manipulate emotions. So it is, it is, it is a fact. All right. Um, so here we go. So a lot of people here talking about is, is confidence all about feeling good in your own skin, knowing who you are, or is there more to it from JP? That's a good question. It is a good question. And I'll answer it in two ways. There's no such thing as global confidence. Uh, so you turn to a person, you go, oh my God, that person is so confident. But that's not true. The truth is we have confidence in different areas of our lives. So I have, I might have high self-esteem or high confidence as a father, but I might have mm. low self-esteem and low confidence as a husband. I might have high self-esteem as a basketball player, but low self-esteem and low confidence as a rugby player. So mm -hmm. it depends on which area we're talking about, uh, you can have high or low self-esteem. And it's a good question because people go, well, what is confidence and how do I develop it? Confidence has got nothing to do with you giving yourself feedback. Confidence actually comes from the world giving you feedback. It's the feedback that comes 
from the external world. So the analogy, if I take the most spec'd up Ferrari and I put the Ferrari on the off-road track, the, Ferrari's, the Ferrari is going to have low self-esteem because the feedback is going to be <laughs> you know, right. good enough, you can't make it, yeah. you're a loser. If I take the same Ferrari and I put it in the race on the racetrack, the self-esteem is going to go through the roof because the feedback is through the roof. So self-esteem comes from feedback and therefore people go, but that's an external locus of control. And the answer mm. is yes, but no, but yes, but no. The, the no part is that you're in control of which environment you put yourself into. So if I'm really good at X and I choose my, to put myself in environments that punish X, then I'm going to have low self-esteem. It is up to me and that's where it is my responsibility to put myself in environments that are aligned with my own self-esteem or with my own temperament, with my own skill set, with my own values so that I can get good feedback. Self-esteem is 100% tied to feedback. All right, but, but does that, that mean... Just shows, go that go just, in the end. Sorry, that just shows how even though we're saying that confidence um, is powered by the world around us, you still have to do the work by putting yourself in the right situations. Mm -hmm. And also it's a bit of an egg and chicken thing because if you go in faking confidence, um, you, you might have feedback of, of people thinking that you're confident, which then in turn you know, gets that properly into motion and activates real confidence. Yeah, but the truth is uh, like on, on everybody and when they enter into a brand new environment, nobody's skilled at level one. Nobody knows what they're doing at level one. So there's always, always an air of let me fake it so I can get the feedback so I can really feel it. I'll say it again. Let me fake it so I can get the feedback so I can really mm -hmm. feel it. So we have to really feel it on level one. We've got to yeah, fake but, it so they level up and get the feedback. All right. So I'm, I always look at these things in game theory and I always go, well, okay, the victory conditions are put yourself in a place or in a situation or circumstances where it will grow your confidence. So that would sometimes precipitate a person only being in situations where they know they can win, only being in situations where they know they're comfortable, and then growing their confidence, but never really challenging themselves. Because well, why would you? Yeah. Well, no, no. I mean, the challenge will come anyway, because if you've, even if you put in yourself in environments that you're comfortable in, there's always going to be somebody that pushes you because nobody, human nature is not about standing in comfort zones. We're all going to be pushed out. That's, that's inbuilt in us. So we're going to be pushed out and challenged anyway. The question is, are you putting yourself in environments that resonate with your temperament? So take an extrovert, put them in an introverted environment that will break. You know, Einstein's um, quote, if you judge a fish's ability to climb a tree to always feel stupid. So you don't want to put the fish in, uh, in an environment where he has to compete against other, other monkeys. You want to put the fish with other fish in its own category so that it can thrive. Well, that's a great argument for why we shouldn't have trans women in, uh, in women's sport. But okay, let's not go down that track. I mean, it's a, it's a, that's a whole other discussion. Um, so Hanan, do we yes. experience imposter, why do we experience imposter, imposter syndrome and how do we deal with it from Congo Chris? Great question again. So believe it or not, everybody on planet Earth, everybody on some level at some point will experience imposter syndrome. And the reason why is because functional people want and need to challenge themselves out of their comfort zone. We don't stay in our comfort zone. And the moment we step out of the comfort zone, your brains whose uh, capacity and goal is to keep you alive will challenge you. So the moment you step out of the comfort zone, your brain will want to convince you to go right back to safety. And the best way to convince you to go right back to safety is to create self-doubt. Why are you doing yeah. it? You might not make it. You're right. not good enough. People will laugh at you. People will judge you. People will reject you. That's the imposter syndrome. So the moment you step out of your comfort zone, your brain will challenge you and create self-doubt. So people will go, well, what if I don't? I don't step out of my comfort zone? What if I just stay in my comfort zone? Then I won't have imposter syndrome. The answer is, well, yeah, but you'll have depression, which will then create imposter syndrome. So you've got no choice. Stay in your comfort zone, have depression and have imposter syndrome or step out of your comfort zone, have imposter syndrome, level up and mm -hmm. create that as a comfort zone again. 
All right. So a serious question now from Sive, who says, uh, how can you support a family member with schizophrenia? They're on meds, back at work, but they seem to struggle with motivation, self-worth, self-care. So somebody with a severe psychiatric neurological disorder, such as schizophrenia, is very difficult to manage yourself. And you shouldn't put that weight all on your shoulders. They need to get some uh, psychiatric help. They need to get some support from family, from friends. They have to have incredible structure. And your job is not just to support their emotional state, but your job is to support their framework, so to speak. So I would ask this individual, what is this schizophrenic's daily routine and daily framework? Uh, are they on medication? Are they seeing a psychiatrist? Are they supported by a mental health professional that's outside of the family? And if the answer is yes, 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 and this is their routine, then I would say to this, to this individual, how do you support them in their routine? What you can't do is you cannot be their psychiatrist. You cannot be their psychologist. You cannot be their doctor. So you want to you wanna allocate those roles and responsibilities to people who are qualified to do so and support them in managing their routine in the day. So are they eating well? Are they exercising? Are they going mm. to work? Are they waking up on time? Are they going to bed at a reasonable time? Are they surrounding themselves with good, healthy people that support them? <clears throat> and you want to basically help support that and manage that. Hmm. Uh, one last one. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, for someone who has ADHD, is there a way to perform at optimum level without using drugs like Concerto or whatever? The moment I, I don't use that stuff, I feel very dependent on it. Is it normal to be so dependent on meds like that? So the answer is yes, it is very normal to be very dependent on that. But this is my issue with people that label themselves with ADHD. I can take a child that cannot sit still for one second at school, but I can get them to do a Lego piece that they love for 12 hours straight without even eating. I can get them to focus like nobody's business when they do things that they love. Mm -hmm. When you do things that you are passionate about, that you love, that resonate with your spirit, you can take the worst ADHD child and get them to focus for hours and hours and hours. So I would challenge this person and ask them, are you doing what you love? Are you doing what you're passionate about? Are you doing things that resonate with your spirit and things that are attached to your own vision? And if the answer is no, well then create that. But in a nut, in a, very quickly, sometimes life gives you something that you're not necessarily passionate about. Whether your boss puts something on the table for you that you have to complete, Maybe you've got to do admin. Maybe you've got to do things that you're not so passionate about. So how do you get over that, especially if you've got ADHD? As we started the conversation, you know, we spoke about color. I always say to uh, people that struggle with concentration, work with your body. And what I mean by work with your body, you'll see, guys, in the day, you'll have moments in the day when you're motivated, moments in the day when you're demotivated, moments in the day when you're highly focused, moments when you're less so. Don't work against your body when you need to be focused. So for example, if I want to go to the gym, I'm not going to push myself to go to the gym when I'm feeling demotivated. But oh boy, I'm going to do extra work when I feel motivated. So figure out your own pattern of energy and concentration and focus and do the heavy lifting, the difficult task when you feel the high level of concentration and leave uh, the passionate stuff when you have mm. low levels of concentration. So work with your body. Okay, I like that. Yeah, There's like some that. practical, useful info. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, but you know what? People have so many other questions. You'll have to wait for the next uh, next round with Dr. Hanan, which will be next Monday. And uh, we, we may have a gap for some of you. Um, your schedule's all booked up, though, right, Doc? <laughs> all booked up. Yeah, all right. Very good. There's Dr. Hanan Bushkin, everybody. Thanks, Thank Doc. You, Doc. We'll check in with you next week. Very nice. It is 7 o'clock, cliffcentral.com. Don't go anywhere. we got lots more coming, including a brilliant portrait painter. We were talking about art earlier, which is such, uh, I mean, this is, this is obviously by design. You know, everything we talk about is so obviously linked. I mean, we were <laughs> just messing around with AI earlier on, but we've got Cyril Katsia who's going to be joining us later. A well-known South African artist, history about expert, spiritual scientist, and anthro, uh, anthroposophist. Also a speaker on all kinds of things. So, <laughs> 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 And uh, 
and we're going to have lots to talk to him about later on. So you can pose all your questions to him, Leanne and Bakabantu, about art. That's all coming up in a little Very while. Good. It's going to be lots of fun. Okay, stick around for that and a whole lot more. Cliffcentral.com. It is Monday. Up next in the Auto Trader podcast. Too much demand over over in Europe, and uh, and so therefore we don't get as much as we we might want to get. I mean, normally there wouldn't be a shortage of supply, uh, mm. so that, that gets balanced out. The last two years, everybody has a shortage. Uh, um, I think if I remember correctly, in 2020, just when the shortage started to happen, the end of 2021, yeah, South Africa was one of the few markets that got extra stock instead of being de- uh, reduced. Oh wow, so that was good for us. Mm. But 2022, everybody got hit. So. We were one of the countries, and there was no one market that was that survived the cut. Yeah. So there was just less production because of COVID, because of uh, semiconductor, because of um, logistical issues. Catch us every Monday at 9 a.m. on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za. Time you listen to that 80s show, Tom Cruise lives another 10 years. Every Friday on CliffCentral.com, Paolo and Dory review movies, reminisce about old songs, remember childhood places that are now car parks, and say some outrageously rude things about Patrick Swayze's brother. That 80s show, new episode every Friday, live or as a podcast on CliffCentral.com. All right. Good morning, everybody. We are live. It's getting a little bit lighter around me, but not in this room. So I still look like I'm um, I'm Nosferatu in the dark. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Well, you, you did do your look from JJ Cornish. JJ Cornish yes. did this yes. first. <laughs> That's right. I should give him credit, right? 100%. Okay, so... Uh, we didn't go into any of the news headlines from the weekend, but there are a couple of interesting things here. Um, apparently, Greta Thunberg, who's always fun to uh, take the piss out of, has pulled out of an event at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. She says she cannot speak at the event, given that its sponsor, Bailey Guilford, is a heavily uh, that is a heavily is heavily invested in the fossil fuel industry. So she refuses to have anything oh, to do with it. Oh boy! That. Yeah. So, I mean, she um, must spend her. She, there must be so much stuff in her mind going on. <laughs> you know, like we just get on a plane and go to Vienna and, you know, just live normally and travel normally. But she has to think about a million things. Everything. And it's such like it's such a performance because actually no one would give a shit. And, and surely if her message is so important and the dumb fossil fuel company is paying for it, she should use the fossil fuel company's money to get her message out. Right. I read. Like, if your message is that important, I read something yesterday that um, Gen Z doesn't. They don't generally believe that the world is going to last until the next twenty or thirty years. 
so they aren't <laughs> even thinking ahead to I mean I know we no. didn't think of retirement when we were young but they aren't it's not even on their radar retirement and old age and they're, they're just like we're all gonna die <laughs> <laughs> well you know I mean anyway so the story goes on she says and she's so serious too like you kind of just wish this poor girl would like have a happy time like just say like <laughs> Just go to a Meet club. A boy, go to a club. Have a couple of drinks. Like, like, have some, have some fun. She, she's what, eighteen now or nineteen or something? Great, no, I don't she's know. Pretty. Oh my god. Anyway, she says, as a climate activist, I cannot attend an event which receives sponsorship from Bailey Gifford, who invests heavily in the fossil fuel industry. She was due to speak at an event entitled "It's Not Too Late to Change the World." I guess she but believes she, it is too late. But when she was yeah. her, when she became famous, she said it is too late. Yeah, and that's and years ago. Telling, and all those all those climate activists keep telling us we only got ten years left. And then when the ten years comes, it's like those remember those religious apocalyptic people who'd say to you, "Oh, the end is nigh," like Bakabantu does every every Monday. They go, <laughs> "Oh, the world's going to end tomorrow," and then tomorrow rolls around and the world doesn't end, and suddenly those people are like dead quiet. They're like, "Oh." I thought you had quite a lot to say just a short while ago. But now, but now, when the world does end, those people come back like, ah, I told you so. But like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're all dying now. Yeah, but I mean, that's scant recompense for like what a stupid idea it is to make predictions about things you cannot possibly <laughs> understand or control. I mean, what I love about this Greta Thunberg and all these other people who are telling us the world's about to end, humans have ruined the world, the climate's going to take its revenge on us, blah, blah, blah is they don't realize like long before humans walked the earth, the earth was doing what the earth does. Yeah. It was changing, getting colder, getting hotter. Lots of species died out. I mean, isn't it true that 99.9% .9 of all the creatures that have ever walked the surface of the earth have become extinct? Right? Okay. Well, I, yeah. I can't fake check you on that. Like, Triceratops. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 uh, saber-toothed tigers um, dodos everything that has existed on earth at some point has run out of life cycle and the same and will happen the, to humans those all the big animals yeah. imagine like the, the microorganisms and yeah, all the insects, insects and worms yeah. And, yeah. and and single cell uh, automatons that yes. <laughs> you know existed in the soup that was the sea a couple of billion years ago Come on. Yeah, but like there's also a thing people forget that uh, humans thrive under pressure. Humans thrive. Like we will revolutionize. If we have to go to Mars and colonize Mars, we will find a way to do it. Not everyone will do it. That's unfortunate. But humans like South Africans, like Gareth at the moment, hotspotting his laptop and hoping to... We'll make a plan, things. you know. We'll, we'll make a plan. We'll, we'll bop us some things together until it works. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Rose, 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 Roland says, not the hardy dog. That's not going to go extinct. Oh. Did you see they tried to bring it back? What, the dodo? Yeah, the dodo. They tried to bring back the, the hardy dog. You understand there's a difference. Fuck. Come on, Gareth. I stay with the hardy dogs all the time. I know there's a difference. Look, I'm going back to the dodo. Gareth, do, 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 they, do not, I don't want, do not, to... I don't want this cacophony of jabber rings that you are doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> <Why not? laughs> So I don't want any more Hardy does. And, and maybe we should get the dodo back. Remember, the reason they went extinct is they were really, really stupid. Well, they weren't stupid. They didn't have a natural predator. And when humans came in, they fucked them up. And they ran towards humans instead of away from. They were stupid. <laughs> they Sorry. Were stupid. They were stupid. They didn't know what a predator was. <laughs> stupid. You know what? But... Some things are going to go extinct during our lifetimes. Just get over it. Who do you think are you things, are? Like Greta there are Thunberg. Things going today. today, there are some right. things just died off right now. Right. Like ESCOM. Okay. So, <laughs> so now, but here's the question How dare you, Leanne? How dare you, Gareth? <laughs> anyway, all right. Let's move on because, I mean, we could, talk, we could take the piss out of Greta for hours and hours and hours, never run out of, of electricity or energy for that. Um, a guy who was paid, and you tell me whether you would pay this money back. All right, so put That's yourself in this guy's position. Hungarian man was accidentally paid 
over 1.8 million rand by the company he worked for. So he's now been taken mm. to court after he refused to return the money. So you know how your salary comes it. through every month? Well, no, but it's his. So he, said, he reckons it's his. So <laughs> the company recognized the error. They contacted the guy. They asked for a refund, but he said he did not have access to his account. So he started off mm. by lying. <laughs> However... <laughs> In a statement from the prosecutor general's office, he withdrew a large amount of cash from an ATM and then transferred it into another bank account. He's accused of unauthorized appropriation, faces a fine and must pay damages. They were able to freeze his bank account and set up the return of the money in the account to the business. The case is similar to a Chilean man who was paid 286 times his wages. And before the company could do anything, he hightailed it and disappeared without a trace. That's mad, it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what I do you do? It depends, it depends on the, the percentage of uh, uh, how much money it is, how much, what percentage over your salary it is. I mean, <clears throat> if, if, if you earn 45,000 rand a month and, you, and they pay you 48, it might yeah. not be worth not saying anything. You'd rather be trustworthy and say, hey, listen, no. there's been a mistake. Mm -hmm. But if it's if it's that big, if it's millions, I'd, I'd be tainted. <laughs> so, so take whatever you earn, right? Yeah. Whatever you earn, yeah. and multiply it by three hundred and sixty. Okay, just do a quick calculation. Okay, let, 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 let me let me open up my calculator. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So three hundred and sixty times whatever you get a month. Okay. Yeah. Oh hell yeah! I'm disappearing. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I mean. I'm I, I'm out of there. If some company's dumb enough to pay me 360 times, <laughs> what, what, like this Ooh. guy, I'm out. But I'm, even I'm you, like, Leanne, I, Leanne be... I thought you were the moral conscious. You, wouldn't you tell? I know. I'm supposed to be the politically correct yeah. conformist. Yeah. But... <laughs> and, and you know what the problem is? I mean, like, let's be fair about this, too. I say, yeah, of course, I'm going to disappear. But if they paid that money into my account, right, it's, it's, it's not cash. I can't take it with it's me. Traceable, so yeah. it's in an account. They can find out where it went. They can say, oh, you didn't pay this. You didn't pay that. Whatever it might be. Then I'd be in huge trouble. So actually, the right thing to do is to pay it back. I hate mm. to say it. I hate to be the good one. Uh, I had to be the moral and upstanding person here because I think a lot of us are just greedy pigs and we would love to get like a huge amount of cash in the account and just pretend it so, didn't arrive there. Two stories, two stories. One, like, okay, like one, uh, in terms of law, uh, I think it's called unlawful enrichment in South Africa. So if you do get that hundred rand above your salary, you're supposed to report yeah. that. Otherwise you stole right. it. That's how it goes down Correct. in the yeah. courts. Like that yeah, so, uh, like student from Nisfas yeah, who took that yeah. money. Exactly. So, but uh, and another funny story in terms of like, I wanted to she stole my line. The student from Nefsis, she goes, she, she, she spent, you know what she spent it on? She spent it on like iPhones and whatnot. I'm like, girl, you got yeah. 7 million and you spent it on stupid stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's how people yeah, are though. They are stupid. They like dodos. That's why they'll go extinct. And she was swiping, Gareth, again, back to the traceability. Mm -hmm. she, she didn't mm -hmm. withdraw the money. She's like, ah, let me swipe. They won't notice. Yeah. No. Because she she came back, she's like, no, I was poor, and I and like I needed it for like, and then they like they pull up the receipts. Uh, you you bought like I think a hundred grand worth of booze this one night at a yes. club. <laughs> How stupid is that? Anyway, so uh, I don't know that there are any good situations, but if I were the, the owner of the company, and someone came to me and said, hey, listen, you overpaid me. Here's the money back. I would reward them. Yeah, and also, shouldn't the person who made the mistake be held responsible? Mm. That person who clicked that button or added those extra sure, sure. figures. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I think this is pretty damn amazing. The Lizzo story has not gone away. Lizzo <laughs> continues to be the big uh, story of the year. Um, the big? On the Lizzo case, says <laughs> DIY Master, there's a bar in Amsterdam called the Banana Bar that is famous for naked bar staff, strippers and eating bananas out of strippers on the bar. So that's apparently where it happened. Yes. And I, I saw such great Lizzo memes over the weekend. There's one of this enormous like pile of, of shit from Jurassic Park. It's one of the dinosaurs have taken a big shit, right? And it says there, um, the, the evidence is mounting against Lizzo <laughs> in this banana game. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
And people on the internet are saying things like this. One girl tweeted something out about like, yeah, Lizzo ate my pet cat and I'm still <laughs> waiting for it. <laughs> Human nature, honestly. Uh, Lizzo, Lizzo nature is, is a bit wild. <laughs> that was what you showed me, Gareth. You posted on Instagram. Everyone who doesn't follow Gareth, you're missing out. Uh, yeah. And these, it's like huge desk. And these guys are just like ch- chugging these bananas. They're like pre-gaming for Lizzo's party. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do love, I love people. They make me laugh. Okay, so apparently AI.com now belongs to Elon Musk too. Yes, by the way, we need to report about it every week because we need to. Yeah, Elon, Elon Musk, Musk is right. Yeah, yeah. We always need to talk about this guy. In the latest <laughs> chapter in his saga to take over the world, um, he's just snagged AI.com. As TechCrunch notes, there's a big shakeup in Silicon Valley, uh, as the URL previously belonged to artificial intelligence juggernaut OpenAI, which is the company behind ChatGPT, right? Mm. AI.com so now directs. Of course. Yeah, of paid. course. Sure. Yeah, he bought it. And probably a lot, because I mean, look, look at how much. And remember, he for. was like a staunch, he was staunch against AI. Mm. Now he's in. Well, he still, he still is. So we'll have to see what happens here. But <laughs> OpenAI bought AI.com back in February of this year, according to Mashable, which also reports it's likely the domain was purchased for millions of dollars, given how rare two-character wow. URLs can be. I mean, yeah, you, there are not a lot of two-character URLs out there, right? There are only so many combinations. Going back to our com- a conversation mm. earlier. Um, Elon also suggested something which got a lot of play over the weekend. I don't know if you saw this, but um, whether or not it's true, it is an interesting topic for discussion. So I think this could get a lot of people riled up, especially in the EFF. Um, Elon Musk proposes an IQ test before users are allowed on the platform in South Africa. What? What? We talked about this, Leanne. We talked about what, 65? So this That's was average, this was yeah. from CBS. So I don't think it's a lie, but um, how do you like them apples? Can you imagine how many people would lose their Twitter accounts immediately if they went for an IQ? And they could do an IQ test as part of Twitter. Like when you yeah, like, log in, for example, it could yeah. give you a quick test and you, and you only get to do it once. So, you know, well, you wouldn't be allowed to come back after you've studied or, you know, <laughs> or, 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 or j- jippoed the test. Because, you know, people will find a way around it eventually, which would make them clever, uh, in fact. Oh so you should gosh. be allowed imagine, to do that. Imagine you're the only one out of your friends who doesn't pass the test. Then you no yeah. longer. And it's everybody will know straight away how dumb you are because. <laughs> because you're not on Twitter. <laughs> you, yeah. you're so, yeah. You used to be so busy on Twitter, Leanne. Why are you not there anymore? It's because I'm really stupid. I have a low IQ. But the excuses but that people are going to create will be huge. No, they'll, they'll, they'll go with the whole, but ah, oh, Elon is running, making stuff work. So mm-hmm. I chose not to do it. But you bring the lead here, Gareth, on this, on this, on this uh, AI.com. Here's, here's, here's the lead. Uh, because people with IQs below 80, that's the 10th percentile Department of Defense category V, are difficult to train. Federal law bars their introduction in, in, induction into the military. Now, this is a true story, right? Yeah. This is actually the way it works. In America, they will not let you into the military if you have an IQ below 80. But the average South African IQ is even lower than that. <laughs> yeah. It's 65. We are fi- we're firing bazookas backwards all over the place. We are causing more destruction. <laughs> Well, evidented, like, like Gareth is in the dark now, we are causing more <laughs> destruction than good. Yep. Yep. Mm, yeah. I've seen the people on Twitter, says Congo Chris. None of them will pass. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are on Twitter, Congo Chris. So does that include you? <gasps> yeah. I mean, this is an interesting question from Gray. Imagine if we forced the government to parliament to do an IQ test. You'd have, be, have to be p- thick as pig shit to support communism. That's right. And a lot of them do. And, and, and an IQ test is not a measure of intelligence. This is not how smart you are. It's how how can you process information, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, isn't that, uh, isn't that smart? Like being well, it, able to it, process information. Look, it, it doesn't measure. Smart. It doesn't measure everything. And people get yeah. very people Upset. get very beat up, and yeah, yeah. yeah, get very angry and worried. And like IQ is not the only measure. Of course, it's not the only measure, but it is still the best measure we have for pattern recognition. Yeah. And for carrying out of complex tasks and even basic tasks in some cases. So while it is not perfect and IQ is not 
the most accurate thing in the universe. It is the most accurate thing we currently have in order to determine someone's basic ability to approach tasks, pattern like, recognition, and that yeah, kind of like thing. Like back to the military example, why would we give a gun to someone who won't load the gun properly and it will probably explode in the hand and kill the entire group? Yes. So, or so we should be doing this to politicians. Yeah. yeah. Or should we yeah, should like think, they can yeah. have whatever discussion they have, but in order to get into the room, there should be a requirement. It shouldn't be okay, just but, a popularity contest. But again, and if we have to be uh, introspective here, um, let's go for average IQ in South Africa and just look this up quickly. And we it's got this. average IQ by country. I know we did this the other day, mm -hmm. but I just want to look at mm -hmm. our results here because we, if we have to decide now, like, okay, so we're going to do this. Yeah. We're going to implement this, right? Uh, how will we, what will we determine as the bottom line for us? And I have to say, we're like right near the bottom. We have a yeah. very, very low IQ population. So if that's the case, where do we draw the line? Like if the U.S. military said anything below yeah. 80, we can't, we can't have you because you can't follow instructions. Um, we're at 68.87, <laughs> okay? According to, we've got a population of some 60 million and the average IQ in this country is 68.87. That's even lower than I thought it was. Okay, so what do so we like do with the, that? So in terms of IQ scale, average intelligence is mm -hmm. 85 to 114, right? To right. 114. So, that uh, so that's someone who's average intelligence. So this is like a, a person who could be employed, a person who can do basic things, a person who can yeah. support themselves. They, you know, they don't shit in their beds. They don't uh, drool. <laughs> there are very intelligent <laughs> okay, people who okay, so, <laughs> so I pulled it up, right? So now okay. we are saying, let, let's let's take our politicians and on average on South Africa. You said 68. <laughs> let's say 69, right? Okay. According to the IQ scale, <laughs> the average South African is mild mentally disabled. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The average okay, but, not not everyone. The average South uh, African. But you, but I'm only laughing because you said politicians. You know why this isn't funny? Is because obviously that you know there's like uh, let's look at this this way: hardware and software. Okay, software yeah. is education. Yeah. So that's what you upload into the system. The mm. big problem with us is that in in South Africa, a lot of people grow up without the right nutrition in their early formative years. Mm -hmm. We know this, right? Um, yeah. Early Care Foundation has been on. So a lot of kids uh, don't grow up in an environment where they are safe and they are loved. Um, a lot of the time there is abuse. There's all that kind of thing that happens. So all of this stuff damages the hardware. Hard way. Like if, if you don't get mm -hmm. the right vitamins and minerals and nutrients as a, as a, as a child growing with your brain. Or as a pregnant school, woman. Yeah. Or as a pregnant woman, so it's pre correctly, Anne. Before you even born, you know, if your mother is like drinking a a, a, a two liter vat of wine every day, <laughs> that's you're going to have some hardware problems when you come yeah, up, right? Yeah, it's going to be a bit of short circuiting so, going on there. So, in other words, the serious part of this, because we can laugh about like the scale that uh, Bhagavant has just brought us now. The reality is, like, if we are damaging young children's brains at that age or before they're even born there is a problem with the hardware that no software can fix you, can fix, you yeah. can't mm. you can't run ios 17 on a on a mac yeah. from like you know one 1983 or whatever yeah that's the problem yeah Okay, so okay, so now we balance. So now we have the problem. We have a solution. So how do we balance it? So I say let's go with seventy to eighty-four, borderline mentally disabled. We mm -hmm. can deal. We can deal with politicians who are borderline. No, I don't think we can. <laughs> I don't think we should allow them. Yeah, it's like I don't think we should. Politicians should be up there with with doctors. You know, there's a. Mm. Yeah, we we expect a lot from them. They've got they've got and, and very also, serious responsibilities. We could have very intelligent politicians, but then your your voter base, because we're a democracy, yeah. is still going to be an average of sixty eight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So look, okay. I don't know. I don't know how we solve this. I mean, unless we we start a, a process whereby the people of South Africa demand that their politicians go for all kinds of psychometric tests and intelligence tests and emotional tests, all the tests we could possibly put them through, personality tests. 
And we only select from the ones who pass those. And we have rigorous and professional testing done across a number of different matrix matrices. Then maybe we would have a slightly higher standard for our politicians, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. But then, but then, obviously, like with absolute power comes like absolute like destruction, right? Then we we'll obviously would run wild with it, and then we'd we'd fall into eugenics. We'd start breeding uh, people. <laughs> well, I mean, listen. At this point, at this point, politicians are of such low quality in South Africa that I honestly don't know that this would be a bad idea. And we could worry about what you just said on the other side of it. At this stage, when, let's just get across that bridge. <laughs> Let's just get some people who can fix the electricity. How about that? All right. So I'm, I'm very happy to have a, a really fascinating human being on the show this morning. His name is Cyril Kutsir. He's a South African artist and a history of art expert. He's also a spiritual scientist. And we're going to talk about some of the things he's really interested in. He's painted two commissioned portraits of Nelson Mandela, the first of which was done during Mandela's first presidential term. Uh, was used as the design for the international stamp that commemorated his 90th birthday. Yeah. And the formal sitters for Cyril have included well-known academics, legal professionals, business people, bankers, and politicians. Portrait painting is fascinating. And I, I'm, I've always loved beautifully executed portraits are some of the most wonderful works of art in all of human history. As, as, a, as a history student, that's what I love because that gives us an idea of what people looked like yeah. If it wasn't for great portrait painters, we'd have no idea. Long before photography was invented, this is the only way for you to know what the famous characters from history looked like. And he's with us this morning. Cyril, what a pleasure to have you on. Yes, good morning. And thank you very much for host for having me on. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I promise you I'm not a vampire. I'm just stuck without electricity this morning, which is <laughs> irritating. But that's that's not unusual in this country. How are you? I'm fine. We've also got limited light at this time of the morning, so <laughs> we, you know, we have to get around the brief of having natural light and use supplementary light. What can we do? For sure. Now, is there an ideal time to paint someone while we're on this uh, this issue of light? I mean, in terms of light, outside, inside, uh, midday, like what's the best time to paint someone so you get the best look? Well, I, per I personally, if I've got a live sitter, I like to have them in the middle to second half of the afternoon because you get a beautiful uh, champagne light, if I can call it that. You know, yeah. you certainly don't want, you don't want the middle of the day. And one can work with artificial lighting if it's, if it's carefully um, set up, you know, so I think one has to be flexible. And a lot of sitters nowadays don't have time to sit very much. So you end up having to do quite a lot of work from, from photographs or drawings, you know, so yeah. So I just have to show people who haven't seen your work how beautiful it is. So here's a portrait that you did of Nelson Mandela, wow. which is absolutely magnificent. Mm. Um, here's, yeah. here's uh, I think that's Matthews Poza, right? Uh, Correct. When he was, yeah. uh, he was Chancellor of the uh, University of South Africa. Of Victoria, yeah, Bionisa. Mm. And, and what a great portrait. I mean, you really just... And that looks like a another, picture. Mm. There's, the, there's the one that, that we used on the stamps. Mm. Um, which is also magnificent. I mean, really, you, you are a very, very talented artist. When did you discover that portraiture was the thing that you wanted to do? Because there's so many people who, um, you know, for whatever reason, decide that they want to paint X subject or Y subject, mm. or they want to do landscapes, or they want to do still mm. lives. Um, and portraiture is probably a lot harder than all of those, certainly in my opinion, because you're painting a person with personality and expression and a spirit and a soul and a you know an energy to them very true i mean i always think with landscape painting and i do teach a lot of students i i have to work with landscape i'm very interested in it too but you can get away with a lot you know nobody's going to quibble mm. you know there but but i think with portraits you know even a millimeter or two can make a huge difference to the likeness of the portrait so you're very right. You know, it is a, it is a an unforgiving um, discipline in many ways, and not least of all because you know you you also dealing with expectations of the sitter as well as trying to do justice to your own integrity and and perception of the sitter. Fortunately, a lot of the people I paint aren't the people commissioning the portraits; they're usually <laughs> commissioned by <laughs> some third party, so I don't have to quibble too much with the sitter about 
about things that they might not like, although it does happen. It does happen. But you're right. How, I think, hmm. Sorry, you, you were going to No, I just wanted to say, you know, they're, they're portraits that, that are more realistic, like a lot of the ones you're showing. And people, you know, might say, oh, they just look like a photograph. But, of course, that's deceptive because none of them really look like a photograph at all if you, if you get into it a bit. But I have also done more expressionistic portraits, but you don't see them so much on the, you know, on the internet, and they're not as well, well known as, yeah. There's there's something about. I mean, we we obviously have photography these days, and yeah, yeah. You know, here's a beautiful portrait that I put up now of, of Nelson Mandela and Grasa Michelle, which yes. is magnificent. You know, you yeah. you seem to have captured him very well, but it but it's also the 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 difference between art and a photograph in this case, and of course, some yeah. photographers will say photography is art and they probably have a point there but there's something about a style that's applied to a portrait which is which is just that it, it has a little more gravitas it feels like it has um it has the 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 essence of that artist poured into it as much as the exactly. essence of the of the sitter um obviously people will pay fortunes for a portrait a beautifully painted portrait uh, they're not going to do that for a photograph yeah, unless the unless the photographer's got a very high reputation internationally, or you know, I mean, certainly if photography is an art form, one well, can't diminish yes. that. Sure. But it has, yeah, the criteria are definitely different. And of course, you're right. I mean, everything passes through the consciousness of the of the artist is filtered mm -hmm. by that. So there's always the stamp of the individual artist on on portrait, however realistic it may be. Yeah. <clears throat> How long do you have to have? people sit for you to paint a, a portrait like the Mandela one? Yeah. You know, it really depends what approach I take because you can do what is called a la prima painting or, or sort of um, wet in wet, direct painting, where you, you can do a, a really quite nice portrait in one or two hours. If it's a head and shoulders, you can do it, keeping it quite loose, keeping it quite free. It's more like a study. Otherwise, you can spend literally months working on something if, if it's got a, a more photorealist character. So it really depends. It's, it's like, and how long is a piece of string? You know, and I think it also has difficulty um, with respect to the sitter themselves and how they behave. Because some people, I mean, I had a client once who sort of said to me, I was doing the third sitting, and he said to me, Cyril, this will be the last sitting. You know, and he wasn't one of those people you were going to argue with. He said, this will be the last sitting. He says, and you know, um, and you, you say you, you're also dealing often with people who are used to giving orders. You know, who are quite uh, highly placed in their in their field, and you don't argue with them. So then you have to make a plan. You know, and you might actually decide that, oh gosh, I've suddenly realised this is going to be finished from photographs, not from a live sitting. And then you have to adapt. So I think you need to be quite uh, adaptable to do portraits. You need to be a bit of a chameleon, in fact. Wow. I, th not, I only now I'm thinking of all the pressure. People who have done portraits portraits of kings in the in the past, <laughs> exactly. centuries ago, who who mm. didn't have a photograph to rely on, and the king would no. wave his hand and <laughs> shoot him out before he'd even yeah. started. Yeah. And then if Absolutely. you get it wrong, you get that beheading. <laughs> yes. <Exactly. Yeah. laughs> Although, having said that, if you look at some of, um, for instance, Goya's portraits of the royal family, I mean, the people are grotesquely ugly, and he yeah. did nothing. To, he didn't need nothing to flatter them. And yet somehow they seem to really like their portraits. They must have liked the way they look. You know, There's so maybe beauty, beauty's in the eye of the beholder in some respects, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> so, oh. so how do you balance, like, like self-image? Because I have a picture of what I look like. But then when yeah, I see like that, I'm like, oh, that's on me. Yeah, self-perception. Mm -hmm. And and how do you, like, okay, I want a realistic picture. Like, I go to you, I commission this picture. Then you come back, you're like, yeah, this is what you look like. <laughs> and, and how do you balance that yeah. with the with with the customer like no sure i mean i have i have been in situations where i've had to paint someone with the with the spouse hanging around in the background and that's really tricky because often the spouse will interfere can i get you a cup of tea while you're working and then oh, yeah. by the way you know my my partner no names no pactrel you know, it has actually very beautiful hands. Why must you paint them like that? And, and I think what, what people don't realize is it actually takes time. You know, it takes time to do these things. But even after the first sitting, if there's a third party there, you don't want that. I try to keep it between myself and the sitter, not have too many people giving un, 
un- unwanted advice, you know. <laughs> and and taxi drivers. There's that there's that famous story, Leanne and Bakabantu, that re- relates to what you said, where, where Oliver Cromwell, who was notoriously not a very attractive looking man, he sat down and they he said, "Paint me warts and all." That's what mm, exactly because he had a big yeah. uh, he had a big mole and a big wart. Exactly. And he was a very yeah. ugly man, and they did they <laughs> painted him. And in fact, in fact, they found his uh, funeral mask. Um, a wax mask that was made after after his death, and they found his actual skull eventually, and he he turned out to have been just as ugly as they painted him. So well done <laughs> to the portrait to the portrait artist there, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's quite something. So tell us also um, in your biography, they, Dory, my producer, tells me you're an anthroposophist. So what's an anthroposophist? <laughs> now you've got to get that right, anthropos. Anthropos is a, is a human. human. Sophia is wisdom. So anthropos okay. Sophia, anthroposophy, it's a difficult one to get your tongue around the first time, is actually literally means wisdom of the human being, a wisdom of man if you're using an old-fashioned sexist term. Okay. You know, so wisdom of the human being is what that is. And it's um, it's essentially a philosophy, but um, it's, it's sort of like a, a modern form of what used to be called the ageless wisdom. And, and the, you know, I think it's, it's something that's interested me since I was a schoolboy. And uh, that is actually something that was started by Rudolf Steiner, the, the, the educationalist and philosopher Rudolf Steiner. Controversial in some people's view, but I mean, you've got the Waldorf School movement mm. and all uh, various other things that came out of Steiner's work, like the organic farming movement, biodynamic farming movement. So I think Steiner is a very interesting and, and neglected thinker. It's quite difficult to get past all the rubbish that's said about him on the internet too. You know, I've been a student of his work for since I was in matric. And he's had a big impact on my own art as well because some of his thinking around art is very profound and deserves to be looked at better, you know, closer. So that's a short answer. Um, be a, I, be I, a long time to give you a decent answer, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, you, you also you you take an interest in in the spiritual side of things, not just yes. the, uh, the 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 material, exactly. and and mm. that of course that must help you in painting portraits because part of what you have to relate to people is something of the character, the spirit, yes. the personality of exactly. the person mm. who you're painting, right? Very much. So. I mean, Walter Benjamin made the distinction once between portraits that. Uh, capture the likeness of somebody and portraits that capture the presence of somebody. So you can also imagine that something doesn't have to necessarily be an exact likeness to capture the spiritual presence of somebody. And and sometimes things where where the likeness is ne- is deliberately changed bring out the spiritual presence more than if it was slavishly copied like a photograph. So there's that whole debate around likeness and presence. And certainly spiritually, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of capturing more than just the likeness of somebody. Yeah, so that is... Yes. Yeah, and of course with spiritual path or with spiritual philosophy like anthroposophy, um, there's quite a strong emphasis also on meditative work, you know, doing forms of <clears throat> meditation, which of course also changes your perception of the world very much if you're involved with that sure. you do you we, we had a, co- a conversation earlier with um dr hanan bushkin is a psychologist we were talking about the the value of color and how yes. color can have an enormous effect on people's psychology mm. on their mood absolutely on their behavior yeah. um are, are there colors that you prefer and others that you do not and that you you, you tend to mm. use more often because of, if people go for example well you know, in a portrait, you would mm. use sort of the, the 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 yellows and the reds and the whites a lot more than anything else because of the color of mm. the human skin. And and also, you see how stupid racism is when you paint a portrait because you use Absolutely. pretty much the same palette, right, across all Absolutely. races. Yeah. So you use, you use exactly the same palette. And so, so not to get political about pigment, but I did once have a sitter who was worried about that and said, how can you possibly paint me if you're a white man? <laughs> but I mean, it's as a, you're absolutely right, you know. Um, they, they are the but same then, like, why wouldn't you be able to paint a zebra or a lion? <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, you know, we're so conditioned by these, these 
preconceptions, you know, that, but I think we're all human and we use the same colors to paint all different kinds of people. Mm. And um, you might use more burnt sienna or a little bit more alizarin crimson. By the way, that's one of my really favorite colors. In, if you know pa paint names at all, crimson, alizarin crimson. Yes. You ask me what my favorite color is, it's alizarin crimson. In fact, my students tease me about it because whenever I come up to one of them to give advice on a portrait they're working on, I always end up saying, Try a little alizarin crimson, and I get teased about it. Wow! I'm the, I'm the alizarin crimson pundit. That's but actually, beautiful. the older I get, the more I, re I like all colors. Depends on the context, you know. Um, because we, every, color, so, so every color is my favorite color, depending on the context. Yeah. Only reason I bring this up is because Leanne found out the worst color the worst in the world, color. the ugliest color in the world, is one that was <laughs> voted in Australia to to be uh, the, the color of all cigarette packets. And huh. they've done research. They say this this is it here. It's the least oh popular goodness. color. It's the yes. least popular color in the world. <laughs> it's sort of well, a brownie green. <laughs> yeah. Is that supposed to look like a tobacco leaf or like a it's I think or, or it's like just a meant to be it's gold. meant to be hideous. It's called it's called oh. Pantone four four eight C. It's uh been selected as the color for plain tobacco manufacturing manufacturing packaging in south africa in australia after market researchers determined it was the least attractive color is that to put people off smoking or yeah what? Yes. yeah that's correct uh, accompanied correct. you know obviously by a photograph of rotting yeah. lungs or yeah or gun, gun yeah i suppose like i suppose that. yeah i suppose it looks you could you could make out a case that it looks like somebody's brought up something you know yes yeah. correct yeah exactly a sick, a sick, a sick color yeah all the so, other so, reasons. so i was a question uh, sorry go, go ahead uh, talk I, about uh, it no no go for it go for it uh so my question sir was like your art style right so now with ai which was a conversation we we're having earlier you can feed mm. like a bot like your entire portraits and your entire art style and then if this bot can somewhat recreate let's say 80 percent of your work how does that make you feel as a, as an artist who puts in hours and three sittings mm. and four sittings mm. well i think uh, it's going to be you know what you're saying is going to be a challenge for everybody i've got a, a friend who's an architect and he mm. said to me do you realize you can put in la corbusier or any great architect's yeah. name and give them all the specs and you're going to have that building come up as a local busier. I mean, you can, all these kids in university now who can put their essay title in and, yeah. and in three or four seconds or so the computer can pump out a perfect essay for them to hand in at university. So it's not just me that's affected, I think. Every field is radically affected by this. And with three-dimensional printing, I mean, you can print very soon you'll be able to print houses. You know, you can already print houses. You can print right. mm -hmm. hundreds of copies of a house. And wh where's the uniqueness in, left anymore in that? I can only say in, in, in defense of art that um, art isn't just about the product you produce. It's about the process you go through in doing it. And I think for people who are sensitive in their looking, they will still be able to, maybe this won't be the case in 20 years' time, I don't know. But for now, um, I think that... I'd like to think I can still tell whether something's done by a computer or not, but maybe I'm naive. I don't know. But, it's a very big. But but surely also, I mean, Cyril, this is not a problem that's new to the art world either. I mean, there've always been art thieves and 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 forgers yes. mm. who've done yeah. extraordinarily detailed mm. and almost. Mm. I mean, you, you can't even tell the difference between some of these forgeries and the real thing, um, and they've even managed to to fool big auction houses, yes. and galleries, and museums, I know. right? I know. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is something that's not new to the art world to have to no. catch, uh, catch crooks. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, if you, you know, someone can put up a video of you saying something you never said, you know, or you yes. dressed or undressed in a way you never were dressed or undressed. <laughs> exactly. So that's, I want you know. You to, I want you to just explain, um, <clears throat> this is a picture, a self-portrait you did with a skeleton, which again, yeah. I mean, this is, this is really spectacular. Tell it's us the story behind, yeah. behind this. Well, funny enough, I was still a student at that time. I was a student at Rhodes University in Grahamstown. And in those days, you were still allowed to have actual skeletons, you know, to own them. But now there's sort of laws oh, against yeah. bones. <laughs> bones. But that, that skeleton used to be in the possession of the university and was used for life drawing classes. I was a student at that time, I think in my fourth year at university. And um, it's not a great reproduction. My face looks a bit sort of ble bleached out. 
But yeah, so I was very young at the time in my early 20s. And mm. I wanted to do, I was fascinated by artificial lighting and what it does. And I had this angle poise lamp. You can see it in the front. Yes. Mm. I was also interested in the visual pun of the angle poise lamp as a kind of skeletal structure. It looks like an elbow yeah. of, of an Mm. So Absolutely. there's kind of yeah a little bit of uh, not terribly funny but just interesting that visual pun and yeah I did a lot of self portraits at that time not so much out of vanity as uh, the, if that you the you the subject who's ready to hand you know it's quite right. difficult because that portrait's painted entirely from life using a big mirror so I had a big oh mirror that's what I wanted to ask yeah you can see the back of the canvas that I'm mm. working on and and I had a big mirror. It had a crack in it, this mirror that actually came down through my family. Huge mirror. I don't have it anymore. But it was wonderful oh, having that mirror. Wow. You know, I think just to have a, a, someone on hand to pose for you. That's why artists yeah. do self-portraits a lot of the time. Yeah, It's a more no, painterly I... self-portrait. It's a more painterly portrait than a lot of the ones you've shown before. By painterly, I mean brush marky. I, I love it mm -hmm. because because of the light. I mean, obviously yeah, yeah. that's that's part of the attraction is that you can see mm -hmm. that this lamp is is casting this yeah. not necessarily flattering, but yeah, uh, no. but quite bright light across you. It's beautiful. Yeah. And and then I think you know a lot of people might have seen this if they've ever been um, to the William Callan Library. But just to explain yeah. this because this is the most wow. beautiful picture. Oh my word! And it really wow. is extraordinary. Um, yeah, no, so, you ha you'll you'll have to have me on for an hour for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But but you know, give us a little bit give us a little no, bit of a of, of insight into background. this it's magnificent. Yeah. That, okay, thank you very much. That that painting is twenty eight square meters large. Oh, so it's it's almost nine meters oh, wow. long, mm. and uh, the better part of four meters high. Three three actually no three and a half meters high, but almost nine meters long, and it is a narrative painting. It tells a story. Um, the reason why I painted it was it was the 75th anniversary of its university. And I was approached by the university to paint a large, in, they call it a mural, but in fact, that's a stretch canvas, unbelievably. To hmm. stretch a canvas like that size was a wow. major feat, you know, for because you imagine you're stretching that onto a frame. Yes. But, um and, and the idea was that, you know, in the William Cullen Library at Ritz, which is the old sort of archive of um, what they call Africana, which is sort of books to do with colonial history, to do with the encounter of Europeans with Africa. And there are some big paintings hanging in the library already, mm. the same size as this one, painted by people like Eric Gill and Amshevitz and the various other smaller pieces too, but those big ones in the atrium of that building, there was always a blank wall opposite the one that Amshevitz did of the departure of Vasco da Gama from Portugal on his voyage of discovery sure. around the Cape. And they wanted me to paint um, something for that empty wall to commemorate the 75th anniversary of, of the university. And the brief was really to, to have a fresh look because, you know, you, you, these paintings were done, obviously, the ones where there were narratives of colonial conquest, you know. Mm. And they wanted a totally different kind of painting that would change the perception of history uh, from a, the point of view of, of colonization. And that one, um, I based the painting on a book by Andre Brink uh, called The First Life of Adamasta, where, you know, he, he, I can tell you a lot about this. He must tell me when to stop. But, no, no, we um, have it. You now, Brink actually took a, a, a story by a, a Portuguese national poet called Louis Vaz de Camoche. Camoche's uh, book was called, uh, gosh, what was it called? Os Luciadas, which tells the story of Vasco da Gama. But in that story, there's this moment in Camoche's original book where as the European sailors are rounding the Cape and they come past Table Mountain, they see this figure of a huge giant sitting on the mountain who curses them and basically says to them, how dare you cross these waters, you know, uh, and various other insults and warnings of peril to all future sailors passing that way. And this became a very important kind of image in, post, in, in not only colonial, but post-colonial literature. There are literally hundreds of versions of the story of Adomasta, this hideous giant cursing the sailors. And it became a kind of image of um, 
African resistance to colonization. Right. And Andre Brink's book, Andre Brink's book is very interesting because he turns this figure of Adamasta into a Khoi chieftain mm. uh, who, and of course this didn't happen, it's all fantasy, who had a relationship with a white woman on the ships of Vasco da Gama. There was no such white woman, but it becomes a very interesting narrative. And I mean, I could spend a long time going through this, telling you everything that's happening in the picture, wow. but obviously we can't do that. But, uh, but there, there's a book written about it. For anyone who's interested, there's a book called, um, I think it's called Reinventions of, Reinventions of Africa. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's sort of a coffee table book put together, but there are a number of scholarly essays by various people writing about the, the project including Andre Brink and various others. Um, and, yeah, I wrote some essays for it too. And it's interesting. Can, um, Congo yeah. Chris in the comments says that I, I don't know what uh, is going on in that painting, but it does have a quality that reminds me of Bosch's Garden of exactly. Earthly Delight. That's deliberate, yeah. It's a deliberate quotation of Bosch. I mean, in Very Brink's good. book, he has interchapters where he talks about the voyages of discovery happening at the same time that Bosch was painting, the same time that Rabelais in France was writing his, his novels. And so, so there's a kind of postmodernist device where the authorial voice, the voice of Andre Brink, if you like, no, maybe not, a, a constructed narrator. In mm -hmm. fact, yeah, it's the voice of Takama Adamasta himself actually tells the story of how this event of the meeting on the beach of the first Europeans arriving in Africa with the indigenous people, how that stands in relation to European history. And Bosch, of course, has talked about. I love those paintings of Bosch with the fantastical things. So this yes. is a, what we call a fantastic realist painting. Some people even call it a surrealist painting. So it's, it's a way of sort of making a bit of fun out of, out of the colonial grand narrative but it also brings into question the whole issue of how different groups perceive each other. So it has to do with Beautiful. what is that called reification or not reification? It's called um, anyway uh, otherness. So you Cyril, know, the whole, yeah, ha have you been asked by your namesake to paint a portrait of of President Cyril? <laughs> no, unfortunately, I haven't. I, I say that, uh, and you know, you must remember that when I paint people, it's never through any kind of political commitment. I paint them no, sure. whoever they are because they're interesting as human beings. But I haven't been approached. Uh, it would be nice, wouldn't it? A, a painting of Cyril oh. by Cyril. I think that's Absolutely. a nice idea. <laughs> Maybe you should write, write and suggest it to him. <laughs> I, I think I will, actually. I mean, he seems to have uh, very little else going on in his life at the moment, so why not <laughs> yeah. it for you? At least, we'll get a, at least we'll get a beautiful painting out of it, right? Well, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Always nice. Who, who to, do you, that was beautiful. Who do you, who do you find? Uh, I mean, I know you're you're probably unemotional about this because it's a job, it's a commission. But mm. um, are there people who are easier than others? Uh, you mentioned <laughs> earlier when you know when the partner's running around in the background. But mm. are there <laughs> are there sitters who are just impossible because they're constantly moving or or they or they're busy with their phones or something irritating mm. like that? Do you have to give them instructions? Like, Gareth, for instance, you would be a terrible sitter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. You really would. <laughs> probably. Yeah, no, just I think, mm. oh, sorry, I, sorry, I just actually, yeah, I think you're right. There are people who are more difficult than others. And it's usually <laughs> got to do with people who, who either overbrief you on what they want or who don't brief you and then complain afterwards. You know, so I think there's a balance to be struck um, on the part of the city. You know, it's better if you sort of say, I don't really want to be shown like that or but but not too much of a brief because I think sometimes that's really restrictive. Mm. And um, but mostly as I say I'm lucky because I paint to commissions from a third party most of the time. And there are instances, there've been one or two instances, and I must have painted close to a hundred portraits, but i I have had a couple of instances where people have not been happy. And it's usually because oh. they want yeah, the, no, you know, why Why have you made me look so so glum? Can't you make me smile? And sometimes for an extra for an extra thousand rand or two, I've changed the mouth and made them smile. I have done that. But uh, mostly I haven't had to do that. No, that's, I'm very I wanted to ask, which client, which client is more difficult? Like, it, is it insulting if you take 
let's say two days to paint me or is like two hours which 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 one is the compliment am i easy to paint <laughs> am i that simple <laughs> well you can always get around by saying that you're so inspired you didn't need much time um, no, oh, yeah. I think, no i think i don't know I, uh, that's an interesting question i'll have to ponder that so i'd love <laughs> so, to know does your does your um um keen eye and your ability mm. to take in so much detail in any normal situation like walking into a room mm. does it and and also then your historical cur curiosity and the meaning behind things and the spirituality of things mm. it does that ever get exhausting do mm. you ever think i i wish that i could just take a moment like switch my brain off mm. and not take in all that detail and just be a bit flat like the rest of the world is? It's a very good question. I think you put your finger on something really important. I mean, I found when I started painting, and I was sometimes 13 hours, I mean professionally, but I used to be an academic, and then I started painting full time. And when you're an academic, you're always in the public eye. You're working 14-hour day, always in the public eye. But um, when I went into kind of hibernation to paint a 14-hour day, I, I didn't see people. And I used to find that I became fearful of picking up the phone. You know, you get wow. a kind of, you know, that, that thing. So I think there are times if you, if you overload with, you bombard, you overload with information that you, you almost come to a point of uh, what hyperneurasthenia, whatever they call it, where you actually can't handle things because there's too much information. I think that's absolutely yeah. true. We have to that protect ourselves, all of us. Very, very much so. I think that's why a lot of artists, I mean, I can cite you literally dozens of cases of artists who've committed suicide or had breakdowns or been in, in asylums. I mean, I think it's almost a cliche. It's almost a cliche yeah. that. Becoming so recluse. I've got, I've got time to squeeze in one last thing because having having the skill of, of being able to, to paint a portrait is a truly, I mean, it's an extraordinary ability. There are lots of people who are very creative and can, can paint things and they can even mm -hmm. interpret real life situations and produce sort of photorealistic stuff. But there is an appreciation for beauty, which I'm curious about. And have you, have you in your, in your painting of people got any closer to an approximation of what beauty is? And, and, and I, I hope it's not some kind of flowery answer about how everyone's beautiful and everyone has their own no, beauty and everyone's that. innately <laughs> beautiful. Like what, what what is beautiful to the human eye? Because there mm. is a, a subjective thing for everybody, but there's also an mm. objective idea of what mm. beauty is. It's such a good question, um, but it's really difficult to answer because I think most people, what you'll find is there's always intersubjective consensus, if I can use that phrase. You mm. know, in, if you, you can show, say, works to a group of five or ten people, and you'll find that, there's consensus a lot of the time about what's beautiful, but they can't say why. They struggle yeah. to say what it is. But, you know, when you think of, of harmony in music, for instance, there are certain ratios, I suppose the length of the string, the point at which the string is held, that gives you harmony. And, and people who yes. are sensitive to music are sensitive to what those harmonics are. And yes. I, I always, you know, there's a whole science around the canvas, the picture surface. There's a book written by what was his name, Charles Brulot. It's a massive book called A Painter's Secret Geometry. And if you go and look at this book, he, he says over the centuries, certainly not only in Western art, but throughout the world, there's been a, a real understanding of, of harmonic proportions. There's certain positions. If I take a square and, and I want to divide that square in an interesting way, you know this issue of the golden ratio. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of that um, where's the golden ratio and i think some some people have a natural or instinctive understanding for where to put something to find the harmonic you know it's like it's like having a, a an ear for music so that's certainly one factor you know mm -hmm. i mean i had a friend a painter um, i wrote a book about him harold voigt and he is he had that ability you could give him any surface and he could put a line there and you could measure and you'd find that he'd found exactly the golden section and he did it purely wow. by instinct. And so I think there is a, such a thing as an inherent instinct for harmony. And harmony plays an important role. I mean, Picasso, who was the inventor of disharmony in some ways, you know, with Cubism and his modernist thing. Um, at some point, he gave up Cubism. And he went back to drawing quite beautiful classical figures with line. And you can look this up. It's interesting. 
And somebody who is a cubist and follower of Picasso said to him, you know, you've betrayed us. You invented this new form of art. And now you've gone back to painting in this classical style. Why are you doing that? And Picasso said to him, you know, they don't invent a new kind of beauty every year. <laughs> and I think there is something in that, you know, there's certain principles and it's hard to quantify them. It's really hard to quantify them. But if you see a beautiful sculpture from Nigeria, from ancient Nigeria, or you see a beautiful sculpture from ancient India, or one from ancient Greece, there's certain harmonic principles there. Yes, absolutely. Which I think if you, if you study it, you can identify why those works are so successful. Yeah, I don't know. Some would well, that's a, that's a very good no. It's a very good answer, and I, I like the the sort of area that you see an overlap between music and and, and art, where yeah. you can yeah. see see harmony. I think that's beautiful. Well, yeah. I mean, I could talk to you all day, and I was very very excited <laughs> to have you on the show. So I'm I'm thrilled to have uh, the opportunity to to mm. ask you some of these questions. I know lots and lots of other questions from our listeners, but it's really really lovely to see you. If you want to fo follow Cyril, you can go to cyrilkutsia.com. Uh, that is his website. Um, mm. If you are uh, if you're Cyril Ramaphosa and you want to have your your painting, <laughs> uh, your portrait done, then what you need to do is is book it immediately because this man doesn't have all the time in the world. He also teaches. <laughs> he's also an academic, and it's a great pleasure to have him on the show today. Thank you so much, Cyril. Well, thanks to all of you. I appreciate this interesting conversation. Thank you so it's much. Lovely to have you. Thank you, well, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. There's Cyril Kutsia. Wow. Uh, and I made it to the end of the show without running out of power. So, <laughs> it's amazing. I'm at, there's a uh, wall, there's a way. Uh, and this week, we can't, we, can't say, we can't say a boot market plan. Not this week. No, not this week. <laughs> um, I'm at 12% battery, so we're going to wrap this up. I will see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock, hopefully with some power. Cheers. Cheers.